there is something obviously going wrong if you've trained for six plus years and then all the other work experience that you've got and then you decide that it's not for you anymore. Before we start today's episode, I just wanted to spotlight an amazing podcast, Black Women Working. Black Women Working is a podcast providing a voice for black women in the overall discussions about diversity and equality at work in the UK in an authentic way. The mission of this podcast is to provide a safe space for black women to speak openly about their experiences of working life and to provide support, advice and aspiration to other black women. I really enjoyed listening to this podcast and cannot recommend it enough, especially if you want to understand the working lives of others. Search Black Women Working wherever you listen to your podcasts. And now on to today's 40 Minute Mentor. Welcome back to Series 10 of 40 Minute Mentor, the podcast on a mission to raise aspirations and inspire the next generation of category-defining founders. From purpose-led entrepreneurs to Olympic champions, you'll learn firsthand from today's successful leaders on what it takes to be brilliant, all in just 40 minutes. Today's 40 Minute Mentor is Sonia Shamotsky, founder and CEO of 32Co, the future of collaborative healthcare. Sonia began her career as a doctor before diving into the startup world. 32Co's unique model is revolutionizing access to specialized healthcare by connecting general clinicians with a network of specialists. Sonia has grown 32Co 5X since April last year and has recently secured £2.36 million in seed funding, led by one of the OGs of the VC scene, Borderton Capital. I cannot wait to learn more about Sonia's journey from position to startup founder and hear what the future holds for 32 Co. So, Sonia, thank you for joining us on the podcast. How are things? Thank you for having me. Very well, thank you. Good, good. Well, it's a, a real pleasure. And having recently had Saranga from Balderton on the podcast, I'm very excited to have one of uh, Balderton's portfolio companies on here as well. So we're going to warm you up with some quick fire questions just to kind of get things going and let our audience know a bit more about you. So if you could finish the following sentences after me, that would be great. Question one, I grew up wanting to be... Oh, I don't know. I grew up as a bit of a tomboy in the Netherlands. At first I wanted to be a professional handball player and then I wanted to be a policeman on a horse. Real strong memories of that. (laughs) (laughs) Love that. Is handball... I can't say I've ever played handball, but I was talking about this on holiday recently. Is this a big thing? In the Netherlands? In Europe, yeah. It's um, European handball. It's a game played on sort of a basketball-sized court with a goal at either end. Really big in Scandinavia, Germany, Spain. Not big at all in the UK. Yeah, I know. I feel like we should correct this. (laughs) The last time I was scared was when? I mean, probably yesterday. I cycle a lot in London, which is always a pretty hair-raising experience. So near death almost daily, I feel. (laughs) (laughs) I think from my years living in London and the number of just like road rate incidents I've seen linked to cycling, I can understand that. I can definitely understand that. Exactly. And again, growing up in Holland where you have special roads for bikes, sticking to the side of the road with the buses flying past you can be scary. Definitely. The most memorable day in my career was I suspect something like, I mean, there were very many memorable days in working in in A&E when I was a doctor. And I think probably the first time walking into a major trauma center and not knowing what I was doing is probably one of the more memorable moments. I can totally understand that as someone that my sister-in-law is a a doctor. And I remember when she was doing A&E work, it was kind of amazing to be putting those skills to the test, but also like exhausting and stressful and really eye-opening. So I completely can understand that. Thank you for sharing. My biggest failure to date is? So I'm actually a very naturally optimistic person. So I really struggle to look at something and say that went horribly wrong because there's always something that good that comes out of it. So I'm, I'm not trying to avoid the question, but genuinely some of the things that have gone most horribly wrong have also revealed just the most sensible pivots or paths forward. Maybe that's also mm-hmm. something to do with like building companies and needing to be able to frame things positively or you just probably wouldn't get out of bed every day. Yeah, again, I'm uh, an eternal optimist, so I can relate to that. And the truth is some of the, yeah, as you say, some of the biggest mistakes I've made have resulted in important pivots and like taking the business to a whole new level. So I tend to frame things in a positive light too. 
if there was one thing I could change about entrepreneurship, it would be? Maybe not something I would change, but maybe something that I would clarify is that it's not that glamorous. I think increasingly entrepreneurship is being fetishized. And I think history is written by the victors. And when you look at people who have been extremely successful, it all looks like beanbags and overnight successes. But actually, the day-to-day can be really grueling and quite boring. So there are times when it's exciting, and but there's also a lot of times when it's just hard graft. I can relate. And I think that's one of the most important messages we that I think is fairly consistent with most of our guests is the, the grind of entrepreneurship. And it's not always as glamorous as it seems from the outside. And I think that's a, a really important message. Well, Sonia, thank you. I already feel like we've got a, a snippet into your career, but I'd love to go back to the very beginning and talk a bit about your upbringing. And you've already said you were born, I think, and raised in Holland. So would love to learn a bit more about you know, early life and uh, I guess how you ended up on the path to becoming a doctor. Yeah. So grew up in the Netherlands, as my name probably suggests. So that's not an English name. So I'm Polish, Dutch, Indian, but grew up in Holland and had a a lovely life as a young person growing up in the Netherlands, which is a very kind of liberal country where there's lots of opportunities and everything just works really well. So I had the opportunity to go to a British school, which I did when I was about 12 and then took my exams and then had to decide where to go for university. And so came to Oxford to study medicine. I think when I was looking at career options, like most people deciding at age 16, what you want to do with your life, when there's lots of things that interest you and lots of directions you could go. I don't necessarily think I made the most informed decision, but I really enjoyed sciences and medicine sounded like an amazing career. And I'd had some, a little bit of work experience, but to be honest, you know, I didn't have a clue what the reality was of being a doctor, if I'm honest. And I came to the UK, really enjoyed my studies at Oxford. It's a slightly different degree to other medical universities in that the first three years are just academic. And then you go off and do your clinical years after that. So yeah, had a fantastic time, really enjoyed the science of medicine. And then came to London to do my clinical years at Imperial. I actually took some time out. I don't often really talk about this but I took some time out between I spent a year just working I'd gone to university aged obviously 18 and I had no work experience no life experience really and I was very conscious of that so I took a year out between and I did every kind of job that I could get my hands on from waitressing to working in a creche to tutoring and that's where I set up my first business which is a tutoring business and kind of, I suppose, got the entrepreneurial bug. But I think that was a really important formative part of my life, just saying yes to every opportunity and not really being too picky about the jobs, just doing them for the sake of doing them and seeing what it was like. I I remember working in a call center on the weekends because you could get paid double if you worked on a Sunday. And the call center was based in Holland, which is where I'm still living. And we would call people in the UK to do surveys, eight in the morning, Holland time. So seven in the morning, UK time. And I've never been sworn at more, but it was such an important learning experience though. It was just, you know, convince someone at seven in the morning to talk to you about something that they don't care at all about to complete a survey so that a big corporate can get paid. So I spent a year doing that and then became a medical student in hospitals, walking around wards for three years, trying to learn the actual practical side of medicine before going and working as a doctor in London after that. So that was my path into a medical career. Love that. And I love the fact that you took time out to go try lots of other things and that you did cold calling. And I mean, having done that myself as well, it was pretty brutal. I said, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. But I think there's something to be said for everybody getting some exposure to sales. I think, especially if you're a founder, just going through that, it's a very good early grounding and kind of resilience and taking knockbacks and and talking to customers and trying to objection handling all good things when you're fundraising and building a team and selling a product or service so yeah that's really interesting you then i think moved into strategy consulting if i'm right so what was it like for you moving from being a doctor into the corporate world would love to understand why you did it how you found that transition and what was the hardest parts of that? Because I'm sure there are people listening to this that are maybe looking to do a similar move. So I'm sure they'd really appreciate your insights on that. Yeah. So the long story short is hard. 
I did four years in, in medicine and the last two were primarily in A&E and I really loved A&E. But as I said, I was running a business at the time and I got the bug and, and I knew that I wanted to go and build things. So I went to BCG and I remember quite distinctly on my first day, there were other medics in my joining group actually. On my first day, I was told that we, the new people, we were going to be very bad at this job for a long time and to just embrace it. And then the person running the session said, and now all of you are thinking, yeah, but I'm not because I've always been really good at things. So I'm probably not going to struggle. I've always been the exception. And he's like, you're not the exception. You are still going to find this really hard. And I did. I was very rubbish at the job for a long time. And I think medics particularly, you don't have a lot of the grounding in the basics because you're very, very focused on one niche and one way of working. So you've got the skills to acquire. And I'm talking about simple things like learning how to use Excel. But then there's also the broader piece, which is what is the point of you even being there? You know, you've got paying clients. What are you actually doing? Who are you delivering value to? It took me a long time to understand that, I think. For anyone else, I think, who is going to attempt that journey and I get people contacting me all the time and I'm always very happy to help because a lot of people help me on my journey to getting that job is to try and talk to as many people as possible who are doing it but to just accept that you're going to be very bad at it at the beginning and really get excited about the learning journey you know if you can look at that and enjoy it I think you'll be set for life I've had many experiences of starting something from scratch and being very bad at it. And I've just learned now that that is the most important and exciting part of the journey and that you will look back in a year's time after that and be like, wow, I've come a long way, but also, wow, I was so rubbish. <laughs> I just really, I don't know what I was doing and it's okay. So BCG is fantastic. I mean, a great company and I would highly recommend anyone who's looking to really experience working in an environment where you're surrounded by incredibly intelligent people. You're being pushed really hard. There's no doubt about that. It's not a nine to five. But if you're up for it, you will learn a ton. You'll get great exposure. You'll work with amazing people. you work with amazing companies. So for me, it was absolutely worth it. Yeah, it certainly sounds it. And having placed a lot of management consultants over the years, uh, you know, the combination of, of, I guess, your entrepreneurial sort of spirit, then the grounding in consulting skills and all the basics, as you described, is a pretty lethal combination. That's awesome to hear. And I, I love the way you have pivoted from being a doctor to being a consultant, and then ultimately an entrepreneur. And I think that says a lot about your appetite to learn and develop and add kind of skills to, uh, or strings to your bow. How did you then end up becoming an entrepreneur then? I guess you'd already been an entrepreneur, but how did you end up starting uh, 32Co? What was the journey to that point? Would love to hear that. And I guess for anyone that's starting out on that founder journey, would love to learn a bit about, for you, what was the most surprising aspect of going and starting another business? When I got to a couple of years into BCG, I was actually sat down by one of the partners he said something that I will remember for a long time. He said, look, you're going to wake up one day and you're going to finally get this job and it's going to click and you're going to suddenly realize what this is all about. And at that point, you have a decision to make. Do you want to continue down this road, which is a service-based business, so you're working for other people? Or he knew a little bit about what I'd done in the past. If you want to go and build your own thing, then you need to go and do that pretty quickly. And I thought it was such a refreshingly honest point of view and I hadn't reached that point yet so I was like waking up every day thinking do I get it yet and it actually really did happen it was one day and I was like this makes sense now and I think I'm good at this now so now I think it's time for me to go and pursue the thing that's just been itching away at me so I actually had the opportunity one of the partners set me up with the team at Digital Ventures which is a part of BCG now but it's essentially a startup builder within the organization and it builds companies on behalf of corporate clients. So I thought that was a fantastic way to get started. So I was part of a team building what is now the world's leading app for patients with hemophilia. So a health tech app, patient facing, and built it literally from scratch with an amazing team and got it to the point where we'd hired the real team who were going to run this business. The product was launched. It was in the hands of customers. And it's now an extremely successful business running out of Germany. So I got to be part of that and see that firsthand which honestly was such a great entry into proper do-it-by-yourself entrepreneurship because it really showed 
with infinite kind of resource and amazing people what you can do. The downside, obviously, is that when you go out and do it by yourself, you don't have just a team of 20 ready to go and loads of cash. You know, that bit, that small detail, you've got to go and figure out. But you can see what good looks like. And I think that was really important for someone who hadn't run a business before. You could see what the end was supposed to look like, which then gives you a little bit more confidence to go out and say, right, let's just do this from scratch. That's where the kind of entrepreneurial piece started. And I think that thereafter, when I decided to leave, it was a mishmash of trying loads of different things, to be honest. So I think anyone who says, I woke up, I drew out a business plan, and then I built the business. It's just, in my experience, that's not really how it works. You try a bunch of stuff, 90% of it doesn't work. Like, you know, I really, what did I try and build? Firstly, I wanted to build a business that was going to sell really premium towels. I don't know why I thought this was a good idea. So niche. I looked around the kind of the market where commodities were being premiumized, as in like hand soap. Spending like forty pounds on a hand soap seemed mental to me, but it was happening. Same with a smelly candle. I was like, but I use my towel every day, and it's cost me ten pounds, and it's quite an important. I quite like a nice towel. <laughs> But so I spent loads of time researching what good, nice towels would look like. Ultimately, you know, I even went to visit some of the factories and ultimately the most I could spend on a towel I found was like 30 quid. And I couldn't figure out a way to make it a 150 pound item. Maybe someone else can go and figure this out, but I couldn't. There's going to be people listening to this going, oh, actually, yeah, I really love, you love a good towel. And somebody's going to run with this. <laughs> I'll send you my workings. You can see where I got to on it, honestly. But I think part of it was also being able to say, look, if you're not feeling it, if the numbers aren't supporting it, if you're not getting anywhere, just being able to say no and let's move on to something else without feeling too much, you know, sunk cost pain. So then a whole bunch of stuff happens. Obviously, we had COVID. So I had this idea, this inkling around the idea of doctors getting more access to doing new and interesting things. It was very clear while I was in the health tech space that there was loads of new and interesting innovation coming to market every day. And it was also clear to me that if I was still a doctor, I would never be prescribing that in my practice tomorrow. The gap is just too big in terms of knowledge and skill and confidence to just take something that's just come to market, no matter how good it is or how much it's suggested it might work. When you're working with patients, you are ultimately always very risk averse. So you're not just going to pick something up and go, right, I'll just prescribe that to my patients. There are, there are rules and there's, there's protocols and like, it's just not really worth your while taking that risk. And I thought it was interesting and a real shame that the path to adoption for healthcare type innovation was so slow and it would literally take a generation to get into the textbooks that the next generation of doctors were reading and I literally mean textbook a lot of it is quite archaic still so that was sort of rumbling in my mind and there were other things happening in the market there was a lot of the space that we're in currently which is orthodontics there was a a ton of change happening so I really started to sort of dig around there and try a few different things but then COVID hit and I was working on on this sort of model at the time, COVID hit, and suddenly the world completely changed. Because I was starting to work with dentists, all the dentists shut actually during COVID. It was a mandatory, lock, you know, nationwide enforced lockdown of dentists. So you actually couldn't visit a dentist for a, a while. So completely shifted, worked with two people on just building something that would help patients get access to emergency dental care during COVID. It was all free. It was voluntary. We had all these dentists sitting at home doing nothing because they were told that they weren't allowed to go in because obviously you're so close to the mouth and people didn't know how contagious or everything this was. So what we did is we built a really simple little widget that would allow the dentists who are sitting at home to contact their patients via video to prescribe for them pain relief, antibiotics and just advice very often all people just need is reassurance so we saw using that widget so i would sit there on my computer and i would coordinate all the inbound patients coming in it was all free so it was just kind of find an available dentist who's willing to take the video call and then we had to coordinate the prescriptions when all the pharmacies were shut so we literally had to 
I think we had to work with Twilio to use the probably never used fax tool integration to fax prescriptions to the one pharmacy that was open like 50 miles away. It was, it was I don't know what, what you remember of those days, but it was pretty mad. We saw hundreds and hundreds of patients this, this way and you know, people who are in horrible amounts of pain. I think if you've experienced tooth pain before and people were taking their teeth out themselves and things like that. So did that for months. And at the time, we were trying to sell it into the NHS actually as a solution to help with to ease the pain. I mean, it wasn't so much sell. It was more kind of get it onto the framework so that lots of other people could use it because we knew that we were just going to be able to move faster than other people trying to solve this problem. Anyway, the... Working with the NHS is really hard. Spoiler alert <laughs> for anyone who's tried. There's a lot of process, rightly so, but ultimately it all kind of took a long time to get anything kind of through. And by that point, the world had opened up again. So then it was time to kind of look back at the original problem that we were trying to solve, which is how can we help clinicians provide this more interesting, innovative treatment sooner in their career so that more patients can benefit and also so that clinicians can benefit because If they can provide more treatment, it's better for them. They can potentially make more money and there's more fulfillment in your role when you can start to actually provide a a wider range of services that you know will help your patients. So back to that point. And as I said, I was looking, we were looking at the orthodontic space at the time because there was a lot of movement there. And so we decided to just start there. The open question was, can you get the average general dentist, of which there are 35,000 in the UK, who hasn't been taught the kind of nitty gritty of orthodontics because it's a specialty area of dentistry, much like, maybe people don't know this, but much like heart surgery is a specialist area of medicine, orthodontics, which is the movement of teeth, is a specialist area. And orthodontists are people who've gone to dental school for another three years to learn how to do it. And there's only about a thousand of them in the country. So if you ask an average dentist, do you feel well equipped to move teeth around in the mouth, I'll say, well, hold on, I normally refer to an orthodontist, or maybe I feel comfortable doing simple stuff, but like, I'm not going to pretend that I'm orthodontist. So could we get a dentist feeling comfortable providing orthodontic treatment was the challenge that we set ourselves and do that safely and do it really well. And so that's what we started to work on. Amazing. So this was 2021 when you set up the business, and it's evolved a lot, I guess, in that time. It's a two-sided marketplace for both doctors and patients. So for anyone that hasn't come across the business, you've already given us a nice sort of taster into what the business started as. But what is it now? How does it work for both sides of the marketplace? How do you balance catering for both the physicians and the end patients? We'd love to just learn a bit more about how it's evolved. It is a marketplace model. So we are a tech company or a platform. So our customer is the clinician. And that's actually a really important part of the culture of the business and how we think about product uh, and how we think about everything that we do, to be honest. We are serving the clinician and the belief is that if you look after your clinician, they will do their best work for their patient. You've just got to give them the right tools and the right information. They went into this career because they want to do right by their patients. So let them do it, basically. That's how you kind of get to the patient outcomes piece is to always have that in mind. The platform, it really does three things. So it's a marketplace in the sense that we connect every clinician with an expert in that field. So for us at the moment, the dentist can work with a specialist orthodontist. So that's one of the top people in the country. And for the first time, they can work as a team on a patient. So they're not kind of working by themselves. As you can imagine, GP land and primary care dentistry can be very lonely. You know, you're in a room by yourself. There's not actually the same amount of access to colleagues as you would find in hospitals. And I think, again, sometimes people don't realize that, you know, one of the fun things about A&E and the things that I enjoyed most was that you're running around with some of the top experts in all the different specialties just there. And you can just walk up to them and say, hey, I've got a patient who's got a dislocated shoulder. Can you help me? And then the next minute is a patient with chest pain, not really sure what to do. And you've got the cardiologist just there. And it was such a great environment and it was so supportive and you felt so empowered, especially where I was. I was working in London. It's so different when you're in primary care. You're just by yourself and accessing that sort of information is just not that easy. And you you can't expect every clinician to know everything about everything. There's just too much to know. So if you give them access to an expert they can work together with on something quite specific, then you've kind of given them superpowers. And that really is sort of one part of the business. 
The other parts of the business are around allowing people to procure the thing that they're going to prescribe. So if we've got a dentist on the platform who wants to provide orthodontic treatment safely, we're going to link them up with a one of the top experts. They're going to work together and then they've got to buy or procure the thing that they're going to put in their patient's mouth from somewhere. If you don't help them do that, then all you've done is teach them and now they've got to go and figure it out for themselves. So the, the other side of the marketplace is that we link up manufacturers of the various tools, equipments, the devices that they need, so they've got it all in one place. So that's the platform. Basically, they can sign up for free, we train them, we give them access to experts, and then we give them access to the marketplace where they can buy the things in one place. So you can take someone who is not providing this sort of treatment to providing this sort of treatment very, very quickly. And that means that their patient base can start to receive this sort of treatment within a month, but they're also getting it safely. No one making it up as they're going along, which is, I think, the alternative. Love it. And you can really see how it's uh, growing the way it has and the impact it's having. I think it's um, fantastic to see. So congrats on all your success so far over the last two and a half years. I guess... There have been mega achievements along the the way and some pretty tough moments. So do you mind just sharing just for any founders that are maybe on the journey now that want to feel that it's not just them that's going through the ups and downs of this roller coaster? What's been the biggest highlight and the hardest moment for you? Let me start with the hard part because I think that's the bit that's more interesting to think about because the beginning is really hard because you've no idea whether what you're doing is right and you're getting a lot of data being thrown at you, but small sample sizes, because there's only one of you or two of you, let's say. So the beginning is really hard. So if you're in that part, it's okay. And the only thing you've got to do is keep moving forwards. And forwards might be left or right or upside down, but it's move somewhere and progress, because it's unlikely that the thing that you thought you were going to build on day one is actually what you're going to end up building. So I had a lot of that, right? You know, a lot of, I guess, false starts, COVID was difficult because our customers were inaccessible. You know, I had this sort of notion at the start of a good idea. Obviously, I wasn't earning an income at the time. And I was like, well, how long is this going to go on for? Am I actually going to be able to do anything? I don't, I'm not making any money. I'm not going to be able to get any money. So those are probably the tough times. And I think going back to the being an optimist thing, you know, I kind of knew that with just with hard work, and some sort of drive in a direction, I would figure it out somehow. So if anyone's listening who's in that position, then that's what I would counsel, just keep going. And in terms of the highlights, I think there are so many small wins every day. I think I I look back, I traditionally haven't been very good at doing this and looking back and saying, wow, look at what we've done. But increasingly so recently and I think the biggest achievement when I look at the room is the team that we've built you know the product is amazing but that's because of the team the customers are really really happy and can't really believe the access that they've got now to this sort of support but that's because of the team so I mean look you know this more than anyone that's the thing that makes good businesses you can have the best idea in the world with a bad team and you get nowhere and you can have a really good team with a bad idea and you'll probably make it into a good idea yeah so true so true so it's a good segue into to talking about your team because it's the thing that will provide exponential growth if you get it right and uh, can really torpedo businesses if you get it wrong so tell us a bit about what it's been like to hire and build for your own business not just the hiring itself, but also the culture that you're trying to instill. I would love to know how that's been for you because it is difficult. It's probably still the hardest thing I find for JBM, which is so ironic given the hundreds of uh, people we piled into companies. But um, yeah, how have you found that experience? Yeah, hiring is really hard and I don't think it gets any easier. So the first couple that you do, you're kind of Again, making up as you go along, making a lot of mistakes. I think now more than ever, you've got lots of tools at your disposal to slightly ease the burden, but it also makes it even harder. So yes, everyone can put an ad on LinkedIn or on another recruitment site, but you're going to get 10,000 applications. And then you have to somehow figure out how you're going to sift through them and how you're going to filter them. So although the recruitment infrastructure and ecosystem has grown, it still comes with complexity. And ultimately what you're trying to do is weed out the profiles of the people that you think will help 
get your business to the next six months when you don't know what the next six months even looks like. So it's really, really difficult. And I think what the biggest thing that I've probably learned is to not hire for skill, especially in the early stages, hire for attitude was very deliberate early on in the types of people that we wanted in the business. And it was around being smart and that doesn't necessarily have to be academically smart, but like smart as in can think, enjoys thinking, enjoys problem solving, humble. I don't think they know it all because you're not going to know it all because we're building it from scratch. So how could you know it all? High EQ, being able to work together as a team, no ego, really important here. High EQ is also very important because we're working with clinicians and we're working indirectly with their patients. So you have to have a ton of empathy to think about what all of those parties are going through when you're talking about healthcare. And people who can come and think about solutions, not problems. Quite simple, tell me the answer. But it's like, you're probably more expert than I am in this because you're the one working on it. So what do you think? And building that muscle and, and getting to that habit. Yeah, I was sort of smiling along to myself because so many of the characteristics you look for are exactly what we look for at JBM. Like so many of those are because I think there's a point at this, particularly in these early stages, it is about attitude. It is about resilience. It is about the sorts of people that are going to come to you with solutions, not problems. I couldn't agree more, to be honest with you. But it's not easy to assess that. It's difficult and you will make mistakes along the way. But I think that's where having a clear view on your values and your cultural kind of what who is going to be culturally additive who is value aligned i think trying to nail those early really helps and then it's just put about putting clear structure and a clear assessment criteria together then it fundamentally is investing the time to really get under the skin of those people and to really test motivations and to reference well and referencing it when it's more junior talent is not about hearing from loads of CEOs about it's, it's really just really honing in on what they're good at, where they get their energy from, the challenges they've overcome, what are the difficult, because you've got to think on your feet, don't you, when you don't have resources and you don't know exactly where you're going. So what you want to test for is some of that more creative thinking or that um, scrappiness. It makes me smile because it's just all the stuff that I went through. You know, I made in the last 10 years of JBM, there were great people for certain times of the journey. And then they kind of it got to a point where the business has moved on and we needed a different type of person. And that's really hard when you're loyal to people and you care about them. But the reality is, especially in VC-backed startups, things are going to change. So some of the talent will grow with the business and then others will not be right for the next stage of growth. And so you've also got to kind of consistently be iterating on that process of hiring. And then that's when search comes in, you know, as you get to the point where you're starting to hire your first executives, which can be such a game changer. And that's where you have to, again, adapt how you look at talent and how you run processes. And you have to trust a search partner to help you go find the best of the best and map the markets. And it's a topic we could talk about for hours. We won't, maybe we'll do this uh, over a coffee and uh, can share with our listeners kind of uh, more learnings. But it seems like you're very thoughtful about it. And that in itself is really key. And I love the humility part because you do see a lot of people getting into early stage startups, particularly if they're going from consulting or banking, who just like, I'm super smart. I've always wanted everything. Like I'm, I'm so good and I've just smashed this. And the reality is that sometimes you really come unstuck because you're completely exposed and you have to be humble enough to relearn stuff, to learn how to do things in totally different ways. And yes, bring all the, all the good stuff from consulting and all the rigor and problem solving skills, but then you've got to learn a whole new way of working. And I think some people will thrive in that setting and some just don't, and they just don't enjoy it. And I think Again, the more we can talk about it, the, I hope there'll be less people making those wrong moves because there's nothing wrong with staying in a corporate. If that's where you're going to thrive, then go for it. I could talk about this for hours, so I'll, I'll stop there. No, I was going to say, I think the point you made about it's just so difficult to tease it out. One of the things that I found quite helpful, especially now that we're hiring more senior people, and I think having some startup experience becomes quite relevant and important, I think is to look for people who have been excellent or attempted to be excellent at something before. And that can honestly be anything. You can be an excellent patissier or an excellent trombone player, but something where they've really, really committed themselves to being good at it and know what the discipline and the hard work is required to get there. I think that's been one way of weeding out the kind of, I'm generally good at a lot of things, but have no spikes versus someone who might not have that CV, but has got a ton of grit and determination and is willing to work hard to achieve. 
Yeah, I agree. And and the growth mindset that you've demonstrated throughout your career, that desire to, regardless whether you are the best CEO founder ever or best COO or an up and coming graduate, it's wanting to learn consistently and never sort of settling. I think if you settle in startup land, you'll get left behind. You've got to consistently be looking to make those marginal gains and get better and learn new things and adapt as the business scales. So I think those are good ones for anyone listening, hopefully. Uh, thank you for sharing, uh, Sonia. Um, I want to come on and talk about fundraising and just some final things around the future of healthcare before we get to our wrap up questions. But just final question on the, the hiring piece, just for anyone that's going through this process at the moment, what has been the most critical hire you've made and why? And just any just little takeaways from that, that would be really helpful. And critical could be difficult as well, Sonia. So I think your first exec hire is really difficult because it's the first one and you don't really know what good looks like. So I'd say spending lots and lots of time on that and not rushing it. You know, having a good recruitment partner and also advisors that are impartial, you know, like a board member or even someone else who is senior who works in that position who can interview alongside you. I think that's, those are the difficult hires. I think the most, most difficult hire is your first hire because you've got absolutely nothing. So why would anyone come and work with you? Why would anyone want to give up whatever other opportunities they have, especially if there's someone who's really good? So convincing them that you've got something that's actually going to go somewhere, but by the way, we're not going to be able to pay you, maybe. <laughs> you know, That's the really, really hard hire. And if you can get that first person on board, and this is really for the people who maybe haven't yet started or are really, really early, get that first one right. I think the temptation is always... I will find someone and we'll be within two weeks, we'll be co-founders and we'll build this business together. I would say, think about that very, very carefully. You know, your co-founder is like a marriage and it can break down and you need to be really clear with who you want to partner with or who you want, you know, multiple people you want to partner with to make sure that the way that you work, your expectations of each other and of where you're going to go and that your skills are complementary in the right places. Spend a long time Almost go like, I don't know if this sort of service exists. Maybe you could do this pre-co-founder counseling. I think a lot of heartache would be solved by doing that for early stage founders because, yeah, if you get that bit wrong, it can be business ending and often is. So true. And that's why I think with co-founders having a partial executive coach where you do sessions individually and together is really important where you actually work through things in a formal setting and consistently work on that relationship, I think is important too. You know, I, I love that. Just want to touch on fundraising, Sonia, because you've successfully raised over £2 million in seed funding from Boulderton. I mean, amazing achievement. So, so congrats on that. We have had a mix of bootstrap founders on this series and VC-backed founders. Love talking about kind of different journeys they've been on. So why did you decide to go down the VC route? And any just quick learnings that you, you sort of glean from that process? The first thing I would say is that it wasn't a given in the beginning. I think I had a lot of advice and I took a lot of advice from people who had lots of different opinions on how one should fundraise or whether one should fundraise. I remember one person who I had a coffee with saying fundraising is failure. Build a business that doesn't need external capital, then you build a good business. There were people who suggested just angel only, and there were people who suggested you know, like Kickstarter type things. And basically, there's lots of different ways of raising capital. I think for me, what was obvious was when you're building a healthcare business, especially a tech product, where at the end of the day, you're looking after patients, you can't ship a beta product. It has to be right 100% of the time. And that's so in the DNA of the company that it's not even up for discussion for us. And that costs money, right? Because with the, I don't know, SaaS tool that's being used by people, you, you can ship anything and, and you get lots of feedback and it can be cheap and you can iterate and if you can code even better. But we couldn't do that. We had to get it really, really right. So we, we had our heads down for months actually building a product that we knew was going to be exceptional. I couldn't have done that without a decent injection of capital upfront from a fund that also really understood the end goal, right? I think when we went out to raise and it was sort of, oh, you're a clear aligner company. And I was like, we're not, you know, we don't think of ourselves as that. We think of ourselves as a health tech platform that is proving out this model in an area of healthcare because we've got to start somewhere and it's a really, really good place to start and it's working, but we have a much bigger vision around transforming how 
patients access specialist healthcare and you've got to have a partner on board with you who understands that and Borderton did and they've been fantastic as investors I have to say so that was the sort of thought process that went into it but it's not the only way of doing it for sure and if you can find capital light ways of building your product I mean go for it why wouldn't you for sure what you just said there about how Borderton get your vision and the bigger vision and aren't trying to put you in a bucket like a or a box I think is super important in terms of finding the right VC partner. I think it can be very tempting, particularly in this climate, to go for the cash that's on offer. But you have to be super thoughtful about how you go and about who you're getting into bed with and and also that they get what you're trying to build and they're supportive of that vision. I think that sounds like you've got a, a meeting of minds there, which is wonderful to hear. We're sadly very close to the end, Sonia. So just I wanted to pick your brains as somebody that's worked as a doctor and then is now disrupting this industry and playing a real big part of that. It's obviously healthcare is ever changing. It's being disrupted by technology. There's lots of talk about AI, et cetera. So I just wanted to tap quickly from you, like what are you most excited about in the future? And if there was anything you would like to change about the industry, then I'd love to know what that is. I think that there is already in the market just an extraordinary amount of innovation that can help patients, but the barrier to adoption is with the clinician often. Right. So you have patients who visit their trusted local healthcare provider and they're not able to access newer, in, more innovative, potentially life changing treatments because the system isn't set up correctly. And my belief is that we should be transferring the knowledge that is held in a small number of people, these specialists, into the hands of the wider clinical population in a much more efficient way so that you can expand access to healthcare that way. At the moment, it's far too siloed, far too concentrated and far too difficult. Patients are more willing to pay for good quality healthcare. We're just not giving them the opportunity to. But the solutions that are out there at the moment to solve these problems quite often revolve around disintermediating the clinician, so taking them out of the equation altogether. And time and time again, it's been proven that that just doesn't really work. Ultimately, humans are an important part of a healthcare interaction most of the time. I think there are times when you can do parts of it without humans, but I think thinking about innovation around empowering your clinical workforce and using, for example, AI to empower them rather than to replace them, I think is going to be a much more sustainable way to build really good healthcare systems in the future. And that's really what we're invested in. Love that. Thank you, Sonia. On to our final wrap-up questions. This is 40 Minute Mentor. So if you could be mentored by anyone, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Gosh, this is a really difficult question because I, I've had hundreds, I'd say, of mentors. And I think there's two types of mentors. I think there are people where you would want to be a fly on the wall just to see how they operate and to see, you know, what went through their mind. So I would love to see what was happening in Thomas Edison's head or in Henry Ford's head, when there was nothing there and they were just building something from scratch. I don't know how useful they would be as a mentor in today's world, because obviously the landscape has changed so much. But I'd love to kind of see how those people operated, even baddies, right? Even like, even the world's most horrendous dictator, you know, Pablo Escobar was a bad guy, but he was clearly good at something to build his criminal empire. So there's something to be learned from those people, even if it was applied in ways that are bad for society. But I think in terms of actual day-to-day mentorship, the, the mentors that I found most helpful are people who actually have a lot of experience in what you're doing and have been through periods of success and failure and can tell you the things that you don't know you don't know yet. Those are the most useful mentors. And because you don't know what you don't know yet, it's really hard to pick them out. So speak to as many people as possible. It has always been my mantra. Like It's unlikely that you'll speak to someone who has had, had experience in this industry in any way, shape or form and not learn one thing. So take the time to speak to as many people as you can, is what I would say. Very wise words of advice. Thank you, Sonia. And I just I can't get out of my head this idea of Pablo Escobar, the unicorn founder. <laughs> that, that if he turned that business into something positive, that this could have been a totally different spin on that whole part of history. Um, anyway, we're moving on to our mystery question. This is a new thing for this series where our community ha- knew you were coming on and had sent in some questions. So can you pick one, two or three and we'll see what they got for you? Two. Two. Okay. Would you like to see more clinicians moving into entrepreneurship? And if so, why? I get contacted all the time by doctors who want to leave medicine. 
I don't necessarily think it's a good thing. There is something obviously going wrong if you've trained for six plus years and then all the other work experience that you've got and then you decide that it's not for you anymore. It's either in poor expectation setting at the beginning or not meeting people's expectations as their career progresses. So I don't think it's a good goal to have people wanting to leave medicine if they went into it thinking that they would want to stay in that career. That said, clinicians are needed to make system-wide changes. And you can do that from within as well, right? You can run big projects internally and make change with a kind of a change maker and clinician hat on. So I, I think for those people who have a real itch to go and do something else, not because they hate what they're doing at the moment, because they see an opportunity to make things better elsewhere, I think we should be encouraging those people to do that. And look, for those people who are interested, I'm more than happy to chat to them and give them a very honest truth about what it's really like. Because one of the things that I always say to people is the grass is not always greener. Healthcare, medicine, being a clinician that has the genuine privilege of looking after people is an amazing career. I mean, in this country, doctors in particular don't make as much money as they do in other countries. You know, you look elsewhere and you're like, well, I am being underpaid and undervalued here, which is often true. But the vocation itself is not something to give up lightly. So what I would like to see more of is clinicians being entrepreneurial within in the clinical world and making something, even if it's a small part of their business or their, their sort of work, being a little bit more entrepreneurial and having the best of both worlds, I think would be a really nice outcome for everyone. Definitely really love that. And uh, I'm sure that will hopefully be important words of advice for anyone that might be a bit of a crossroads of their career in medicine. Final question. If there was one piece of advice that you'd like to leave our listeners with today, what would it be? I would say, say yes to more things than you think are sensible because you never know what will come out of the opportunities that you take, especially the ones where you think there's, I just can't see how this is going to be useful or helpful. Very often those are the things to say yes to and to throw yourself into it with both feet and be open and humble and listen and you will learn a lot. And that's where most of the opportunities that have come to me have come from. It's not from doing the obvious things. It's from doing random stuff and talking to someone and going to something that I didn't necessarily know whether it would end up being useful. Yeah, I love that. Be open-minded, say yes. There's so many great pieces of advice, Sonia, in this episode. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about what you're building and I really hope lots of our listeners will check it out. And uh, I'm sure there are many people that have heard this but that will be scribbling lots of notes from your uh, story and great advice. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Really enjoyed chatting. Great questions as well. Really got me thinking. Good stuff. Thank you very much, Sonia. That's all from us today, but do make sure you check out the links in the show notes for more on today's 40 Minute Mentor. And if you have any recommendations for future guests, then why don't you drop our head of marketing and 40 Minute Mentor producer Hannah a line on hannah at jbmc.co.uk. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, and I look forward to seeing you again next week for more pocket-sized mentorship.